Chapter 7 of Leonora by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evans. Chapter 7 The Departure. As I approach the crisis in Leonora's life, I hesitate, fearing lest by an unfit phrase I should deprive her of your sympathies, fearing also that this fear may incline me to set down less than the truth about her. She was possessed by a mysterious sensation of content. She wished to lie supine, except in her domestic affairs, and to dream that all was well, or would be well. It was as though she had determined that nothing could extinguish or even disturb the mild flame of happiness which burned placidly within her. And yet the anxieties of her existence were certainly increasing again. On the morning after the opera, John had departed on one of his sudden flying visits to London. These journeys, formerly frequent, had been in abeyance for a time, and their assumption seemed to point to some renewal of his difficulties. He had called at Church Street on his way to Knype, and Carpenter had brought back word that Miss Myatt was wonderfully better. But when Leonora herself called at Church Street later in the morning, and at last saw Aunt Hannah, she was impressed by the change in the old creature whose nervous system had the appearance of being utterly disorganised. Then there was the difficult case of Ethel and Fred Riley, in which Leonora had done nothing whatever. And there was the case of Rose, whose alienation from the rest of the household became daily more marked. Finally, there was the new and portentous case of Millicent, probably the most disconcerting of the three. Nevertheless, amid all these solicitudes, Leonora remained equable, optimistic, and quietly joyous. A state of mind so miraculously altered in a few hours gave her no surprise. It seemed natural. Everything seemed natural. She ceased for a period to waste emotion in the futile desire for her lost youth. On the second day after the opera, she was sitting at her Sheraton desk in the small, nondescript room which opened off the dining room. In front of her lay a large tablet with innumerable names of things printed on it in three columns. Opposite each name, a little hole had been drilled, and in many of the holes, little sticks of wood stood upright. Leonora uprooted a stick, exiling it to a long horizontal row of holes at the top of the tablet, and then wrote in a pocket book. She uprooted another stick and wrote again, so continuing till only a few sticks were left in the columns. These she spared. Then she rang the bell for the parlourmaid and relinquished to her the tablet. The peculiar rite was over. Is dinner ready? she asked, looking at the small clock which she usually carried about with her from room to room. Yes, am Then ring the gong, and tell Carpenter I shall want the trap at a quarter past two, for two. I am going to shop in Hanbridge, and then to meet Mr. Stanway at night. We shall be in before four. Have some tea ready. And don't forget the eclairs today, Bessie. She smiled. No, m'm. Did you think I want to write about them new dog biscuits, m'm? I'll write now, said Leonora and she turned to the desk. But a gong sounded. The dinner was brought in. Through the doorway between the two rooms, there was no door, only a portiere, Leonora heard Ethel's rather heavy footsteps. I don't think Mother will want you to wait today, Bessie, Ethel's voice said. Then followed, after the maid's exit, the noise of a dish cover being lifted and dropped, and Ethel's exclamation, Ha! Huh. And then the voices of Rose and Millicent approached in altercation. Come along, mother, Ethel called out. Coming, answered Leonora, putting the note in an envelope. The idea, said Rose's voice scornfully. Yes, retorted Millie's voice. The idea. Leonora listened as she wrote the address. You always were a conceited thing, Millie, and since this wonderful opera you're positively ridiculous. I almost wish I'd gone to it now just to see what you were like. Ah, oh, well, you just didn't, and so you don't know. No, indeed. I've got something better to do than watch a pack of amateurs. There was a pause for silent contempt. Well, keep it up, keep it up. Anyway, how I'm perfectly certain Father won't let you go. I shall go. And besides, I want to go to London, and you may be absolutely certain, my child, that he won't let two of us go. I shall speak to him first. Oh, no, you won't. Shan't I? You'll see. No, you won't because it just happens that I spoke to him the night before last, and he's making inquiries and he'll tell me tonight. 
So what do you think of that? Leonora drew aside the portiere. My dear girls, she protested benevolently, standing there. The feud, always apt thus to leap into a perfectly Corsican fury of bitterness, sank back at once to its ordinary level of passive mutual repudiation. Rose and Millicent were not bereft of the finer feelings which distinguish humanity from the beasts of the jungle. Sometimes they could be almost affectionate. There were, however, moments where to all appearance they hated each other with a tigerish and crouching hatred such as may be found only between two opposing feminine temperaments linked together by the family tie. What's this about your going to London, Rose? Leonora asked in a voice soothing but surprised when the meal had begun. You know, Mamma, I mentioned it to you the other day. The girl's tone implied that what she had said to Leonora perhaps went in at one ear and out at the other. Leonora remembered. Rose had, in fact, casually told her that a school friend in Oldcastle who was studying for the same examination as herself had gone to London for six weeks' final coaching under what Rose called a lady crammer. But you didn't tell me that you wanted to go as well, Leonora said. Yes, mother, I did, Rose affirmed with calm. You forget. I'm sure I shan't pass if I don't go. So I asked father while you were all at this opera affair. And what did he say? Ethel demanded. He said he would make inquiries this morning and see. Ethel gave a laugh of good-natured derision. Yes, she exclaimed, and you'll see too. In response to this oracular utterance, Rose merely bent lower over her plate. Millicent, conscious of a brilliant vocation and of an impassioned resolve, refrained from the discussion, and the sense of her ineffable superiority bore hard on that lithe, mercurial youthfulness. The signal, in praising Millicent's performance of the opera, had predicted for her a career, and had thoughtfully quoted instances of well-born amateurs who had become professionals and made great names on the stage. Millicent knew that all Bursley was talking about her, and yet the family life was unaltered. No one at home seemed to be much impressed, not even Ethel, though Ethel's sympathy could be depended upon. Millie was still Millie, the youngest, the least important, the chit of a thing. At times it appeared to her as though the triumph of that ecstatic and glorious night was, after all, nothing but an illusion, and that only the interminable dailiness of family life was real. Then the ruthless and calculating minx in her shut tight those pretty lips, and coldly determined that nothing should stand against ambition. I do hope you will pass, said Leonora, cordially to Rose. You certainly deserve to. I know I shan't unless I get some outside help. My brain isn't that sort of brain, it's another sort. Anyone has to knuckle down to these wretched exams first. Leonora did not understand her daughter. She knew, however, that there was not the slightest chance of Rose being allowed to go to London alone for any length of the period, and she wondered that the Rose could be so blind as not to perceive this. As for Millicent's vague notions, which the child had furtively broached during her father's absence, the more Leonora thought about them, the more fantastically impossible they seemed. She changed the subject. The repast, which had commenced with due ceremony, degenerated into a feminine mess, hasty, informal, counterfeit. That elaborate and irksome pretense that a man is present, with which women, when they are alone, always begin to eat, was gradually dropped, and the meal ended abruptly, inconclusively, like a bad play. Let's go for a walk, said Ethel. Yes, said Millie, let's. Mamma, Millie called from the drawing-room window. Leonora was walking about the misty garden, where little now remained that was green, save the yews, the cypresses, and the rhododendrons. Bran, his white and fawn coat glittering with minute drops of water, plodded heavily and content by her side along the narrow, damp paths. He was dressed for driving, and awaited Carpenter with the trap. In reply to Leonora's gesture of attention, Milly, instead of speaking from the window, ran quickly to her across the sodden lawn. And Minnie's running was so girlish, simple and unaffected that Leonora seemed by means of it to have found her daughter again, the daughter who had disappeared in the adroit and impudent creature of the footlights. He was glad of the reassurance. 
Yes, Mr. Tremlow, Mamma," said Milly, with a rather embarrassed air. And they looked at each other, while Bran frowned in glancing upwards. At the same moment, Arthur Tremlow and Ethel entered the garden together. The social atmosphere was rendered bracing by this invasion of the masculine. Every personality awoke and became vigilantly itself. We met Mr. Tremlow on the marsh, Mother, walking from Oak Castle to Bursley, said Ethel, after the ritual of greeting, and so he brought him in. As Leonora was on the point of leaving the house, the situation was somewhat awkward, and a slight hesitation on her part showed this. You're all going out, he said. Oh, Mamma, Milly cried quickly, do let me go and meet Father instead of you. I want to. What, alone? Leonora exclaimed in a kind of dream. I'll go too said Ethel. And suppose you have the horse down? Well, then we'll take Carpenter, Minnie suggested. I'll run and tell him to put his overcoat on and put the back seat in. She scampered off. Tremlow was fondling the dog with an air of detachment. In the fraction of an instant, a thousand wild and disturbing thoughts swept through Leonora's brain. Was it possible that Arthur Tremlow had suggested this change of plan to the girls? Or had the girls already noticed with the keen eyes of youth that she and Arthur Tremlow enjoyed each other's society and naively wished to give her pleasure? Would Arthur Tremlow, but for the accidental encounter on the marsh, have passed by her home without calling? If she remained, what conclusion could not be drawn? If she persisted in going, might not he want to come with her? He was ashamed of the preposterous inward turmoil. And my shopping? He smiled, blushing. Give me the list, Mater, said Ethel, and took the Morocco book out of her hand. Never before had Leonora felt so helpless in the sudden clutch of fate. She knew she was a willing prey. She wished to remain, and politeness to Arthur Tremlow demanded that this wish should not be disguised. Yet what would she not have given even to have felt herself able to disguise it? How incredibly stupid I am! Thought. No sooner had the two girls departed than Tremlow began to laugh. Ha! Ah, I must tell you, he said, with candid amusement, that this is a plant. Those two daughters of yours calculated to leave you and me here alone together. Yes, she murmured, still constrained. Miss Milly wants me to talk you round about her going in front of the stage. When I met them on the marsh, of course I began to pay her compliments and I just happened to say that I thought she was a born comedienne. And before I knew it, I was blindfolded, handcuffed, and carried off, so to speak. This was the simple, innocent explanation. Oh, how incredibly stupid, stupid, stupid I was, she thought again, and a feeling of exquisite relief surged into her being. Mingled with that relief was the deep joy of realising that Ethel and Milly fully shared her instinctive predilection for Arthur Tremlow. Here, indeed, was the supreme security. I must say my daughters get more and more surprising every day, she remarked, impelled to offer some sort of conventional apology for her children's unconventional behaviour. They are charming girls, he said briefly. On the surface of her profound relief and joy, there played like a flying fish the thought, was he meaning to call in any case? Was he on his way here? They talked about Aunt Hanno, whom Tremlow had seen that morning and who was improving rapidly. But he agreed with Leonora that the old lady's vitality had been irretrievably shattered. Then there was a pause, followed by some remarks on the weather, and then another pause. Bran, after watching them attentively for a few minutes as they stood side by side near the French window, rose up from off his haunches and walked gloomily away. Bran, Bran, Tremlow cried. It's no use, she laughed. He's vexed. He thinks he's been neglected. He'll go to his kennel and nothing will bring him out of it except food. Come into the house. It's going to rain again. Well, the visitor exclaimed familiarly. They were seated by the fire in the drawing room. Leonora was removing her gloves. Well, she repeated. And so you still think Milly ought to be allowed to go on the stage? I think she will go on the stage, he said. You can't imagine how it upsets me even to think of it. Leonora seemed to appeal for his sympathy. Oh, yes, I can, he 
replied. Didn't I tell you the other night that I knew exactly how you felt? But you've got to get over that, I guess. You've got to get on to yourself. Mr. Mart told me what he said to you. So Uncle Meshach has been talking about it, too, he interrupted. Why, yes, certainly, of course, he's quite right. But he's bound to go her own way. Why not make up your mind to it and help her straighten things out for her? But, look here, Mrs. Stanway, he leaned forward. Will you tell me just why it upsets you to think of your daughter going on the stage? I don't know. I can't explain. But it does. She smiled at him, smoothing out her gloves one after the other on her lap. It's nothing but superstition, you know, he said gently, returning her smile. Yes, she admitted. I suppose it is. He was silent for a moment, as if undecided what to say next. She glanced at him surreptitiously, and took in all the details of his attire. High white collar, the dark tweed suit, obviously of American origin, the thin silver chain that emerged from beneath his waistcoat and disappeared on a curve into the hip pocket of his trousers, the boots with their long, pointed toes. His heavy moustache and the smooth, bluish chin struck her as ideally masculine. No parents, burst out. No parents can see things from their children's point of view. Oh, she protested, there are times when I feel so like my daughters that I am then. He nodded. Yes, he said, abandoning his position at once. I can believe that. You're an exception. If I hadn't sort of known all the time that you were, I, I wouldn't be here now talking like this. It's so accidental, the whole business, she remarked branching off to another aspect of the case in order to mask the confusion caused by the sincere flattery in his voice. It was only by chance that Mary had that particular part at all. Suppose she hadn't had it. What then? Everything's accidental, he replied. Everything that ever happened is accidental in a way, and another it isn't. If you look at your own life, for instance, you'll find it's been simply a series of coincidences. I'm sure mine has been. She had chance from beginning to end. Yes, she said thoughtfully, and put her chin in the palm of her left hand. And as for the stage, why, nearly everyone goes on to the stage by chance. It just occurs, that's all. Moreover, I guarantee that the parents of 50% of all the actresses now on the boards began by thinking what a terrible blow it was to them that their daughters should want to do that. Can't you see what I mean? He emphasised his words more and more. I'm certain you can. She signified assent. It seemed to her, as he continued to talk, that for the first time she was listening to natural, convincing common sense in that home of hers, where existence was governed by precedent and by conventional ideas and by the profound parental instinct which meets all requests with a refusal. It seemed to her that her children, though to outward semblance they had much freedom, had never listened to anything but no, no, dear, of course you can't. I think you had better not, and once for all I forbid it. She wondered why this should have been so, and why its strangeness had not impressed her before. She had a distant, fleeting vision of a household in which parents and children behaved like free and sensible human beings, instead of like the virtuous and the martyrised puppets of a terrible system called acting for the best. And she thought again what an extraordinary man Arthur Tremlow was. Strong-minded, clear-headed, sympathetic, and delightful. She enjoyed intensely the sensation of their intimacy. Jack will never agree, he said, when she could say nothing else. Ah, Jack, he slightly imitated her show. Well, that remains to be seen. Why do you take all this trouble for Millie? he asked him. It's very good of you. And because I'm a fool, a meddly ass, he replied lightly, standing up and stroking his clothes. You aren't, or I said you are a dear. No, he went on in a serious tone. Milly just wanted me to speak to you, and after all, I didn't see why I shouldn't. It's no earthly business of mine, but... Oh, well, goodbye, I must be getting along. Have you got an appointment to, to keep? She questioned him. No, not an appointment. Well, then you will stay a little longer. The trap will be back quite soon. Her voice seemed playfully to indicate that, 
as she had submitted to his domination, so must he must submit now to hers. And if you'll excuse me one moment, I will go and take off this thick jacket. Up in the bedroom, as she removed her coat in front of the pier glass, she smiled at her image timorously, yet in full content. Minnie's prospects did not appear to her to be practically improved, nor could she piece out of Arthur Tremlow's conversation a definite argument. Nevertheless, she felt that he had made her see something more clearly than heretofore, that he had induced in her, not by logic, but by persuasiveness, a mood towards her children which was brighter, more sanguine, and even more loving than any in her previous experience. She was glad that she had left him alone for a minute, because such familiar treatment of him somehow established definitely his status as a friend of the house. Listen, Tremblow, said Stanway loudly, I meant to run down to the office for an hour this afternoon, but if you'll stay, I'll stay. That's a bargain, eh? John had returned from London blusterously cheerful, and Tremlow stood in the centre of his vehement, noisy hospitality, as in the centre of a typhoon. He consented to stay, because the two girls, with hair blown and still in their wet mackintoshes, took him by the arm and said he must. He was not the first guest in that house whom the apparent heartiness of the host had failed to convince. Always there was something sinister, insincere and bullying in the invitations which John gave and in his reception of visitors. Hence it was perhaps that visitors did not abound under his roof, despite the richness of the table and the ordered elegance of every appointment. Women paid calls. The girls, unlike Leonora, had their intimates, including Harry. But men seldom came, and it was not often that the principal meals of the day were shared by an outsider of either sex. Arthur's presence on a second occasion was therefore the more stimulating. It affected the whole house, even to the kitchen, which indeed usually vibrates in sympathy with the drawing room. In Bessie's vivacious demeanour as she served the high tea at six o'clock, might be observed to the symptoms of the agreeable excitation which all felt. Even Rose unbent, and Leonora thought how attractive the girl could be when she chose. But towards the end of the meal, it became evident that Rose was preoccupied. Leonora, Ethel and Millicent passed into the drawing room. John pulled out his immense cigar case, and the two men began to smoke. Come along, said Stanway, speaking thickly with the cigar in his mouth. Papa, said Rose ominously, just as he was following Tremlow out of the door. She spoke with quiet, cold distinctness. What is it? Did you inquire about that? He paused. Oh, yes, Rose, he answered rapidly. I inquired. She seemed a very clever woman, I must say, but I, I've been thinking it over and I've come to the conclusion that it won't do for you to go. I don't like the idea of it, you in London for six weeks or more alone. You must do what you can here. But if you fail this time, you must try again. But I can stay in the same lodgings as Sarah Fuge. The house is kept by a cousin or some relation. Well, then there's the expense, he proceeded. Father, I told you the other night I didn't want to put you to any expense. I've got thirty-seven pounds of my own, and I will pay. I prefer to pay. Oh, no, no, he exclaimed. Well, why can't I go? she demanded bluntly. I'll, I'll think it over again, but I don't like it, Rose. I, I don't like it. But there isn't a day to waste, father, she complained. Bessie entered to clear the table. Oh, well, I'll think it over again. He breathed out smoke and departed. Rose set her lips hard. He was seen no more that evening. In the drawing-room, Stanway found Tremlow and Millicent talking in low voices on the hearthrug. Ethel lounged on the sofa. Leonora was not present, but she came in immediately. Let's have a game of solo, John suggested and, because five was a convenient number, they all played. Tremlow and Millie were the best performers. Millie's gift for card-playing was notorious in the family. Do you ever play poker? Tremlow asked, when the other three had been beggared of counters. No, said John Corsley. Not here. That's lots of fun, Tremlow went on, looking at the girls. Oh, Mr Tremlow, Millie cried, it's awfully gambly, isn't it? Do teach us. In a quarter of an hour, Millie was bluffing her father with success. She said that in future she would never want to play at any other game. As for Leonora, though she lost and gained counters with happy equanimity, 
He did not like the game. It frightened her. When Millie had shown a straight flush and scooped the kitty, she sent the child out of the room with a message to the kitchen concerning coffee and sandwiches. What Millie sing? Romano asked. Certainly, if you wish, Leonora responded. Aye, let's have something, said Stanway lazily. And when Millicent returned, she was told that she must sing before eating. She sang, Love is a plaintive song, to Ethel's inert accompaniment. And she gave it exactly as though she'd been on the stage, with all the dramatic action, all the freedom, all the allurements, which she had lavished on the audience in the town hall. Very good, said her father. Like that, very pretty. Didn't hear it the other night. Twemlow merely thanked the artist. Leonora was silently uncomfortable. After coffee, both the girls disappeared. Tremo looked round and then spoke to Stanway. I've been very much impressed by your daughter's talent, he said. His tone was extremely serious. It implied that, now the children were gone, the adults could talk with freedom. Stanway was a little startled, and more than a little flattered. Really? he questioned. Really? said Tremo, emphasising still further his seriousness. Has she ever been taught? Only by a local teacher up here at Hillport, Leonora told him. She ought to have lessons from a first-class master. Why? asked Stanway abruptly. Well, Tremor said, you never know. You honestly think our voice is worth cultivating? Tom demanded, impelled to participate in Tremlow's gravity. I do, and not only her voice. Ah, Stanway mused. There's no first-class masters in this district. Why, I met a man from Manchester at the Five Towns Hotel last night, said Twemlow, who comes down to Knipe once a week to give lessons. He used to sing in opera. They say he's the best man about, and that he's taught a lot of good people. Ah, I forget his name. I expect you mean Cecil Corfe, Leonora said cheerfully. She'd been amazed at the compliance of John's attitude. Ah, yes, that's it. At the same moment there was a faint noise at the French window. John went to investigate. As soon as his back was turned, Tremlow glanced at Leonora with eyes full of a private amusement which he invited her to share. Can't I just handle him? he seemed to say. She smiled, but cautiously, lest she should disclose too fully her intense appreciation of his personality. Why, it's the dog! Stanway proclaimed, and went through! What's he doing, Louis? It's rainy like the devil. I'm afraid I didn't fasten him up this afternoon. I forgot, said Leonora. Oh, my new rug! Ran plunged into the room with a glad, deafening bark, his tail thwacking the furniture like the flat of a saw. Get out, you great brute, Stanway ordered. And then on the step he shouted into the darkness for Carpenter. Tremlay rose to look on. I can't let you walk to the station tonight, Tremlow, said Stanway, still outside the room. Carpenter shall drive you. Yes, he shall, so don't argue. And while I was about it, he may as well take you straight tonight. You can go in the buggy, there's a hood to it. When the time came for departure, John insisted on lending to Twemlow a large, driving overcoat. They stood in the hall together while Twemlow fumbled with the complicated apparatus of buttons. Stanway whistled. By the way, he said, when are you coming in to look through those old accounts? Oh, I don't know, Femno answered, somewhat taken by surprise. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll send you copies of them, eh? Oh, I think you needn't trouble, said Twemno carelessly. I guess I shall write to my sister and tell her I can't see any use in trying to worry out the old man's finances at this time of day. However, Femno repeated, I'll send you the copies all the same. And when you write to your sister, will you give her my kindest regards? The whole family, except Rose, came into the porch to bid him good night. In the darkness and the heavy rain could dimly be seen the rounded form of the buggy. The cop's flanks shone in the glittering ray of the lamps. The carpenter was hidden under the hood. His mysterious hand raised the apron, and Tremlow stepped quickly in. Good night, said Ethel. Good night, Mr. Tremlow, said Minnie. Be good. You'll see us again before you leave, Tremlow, said John's imperious voice. You aren't going back to America just yet, are you? Leonora asked from the back. No reply came from within the hood.
Mother says you aren't going back to America just yet, are you, Mr. Tremlow? Minnie screamed in her trouble. Father Tremlow showed his face. No, not yet, I think, he, he called. I'll see you again, certainly, and thanks once more, said Carpenter. The next evening, after tea, John, Leonora and Rose were in the drawing room. Millie had run down to see her friend Sissy Burgess, having with fine cruelty chosen that particular night, because she happened to know that Harry would be out. Ethel was invisible. Rose had returned with bitter persistence to the siege of her father's obstinacy. I should have six weeks clear, she was saying. John consulted his pocket calendar. No, he corrected her, you would have only a month, which isn't worth while. I should have six weeks, she repeated. The exam isn't till January the 7th. But Christmas, what about Christmas? You must be here for Christmas. Why? demanded Rose. Oh, Rosie, Leonora protested, you can't be away for Christmas. Why not? the girl demanded again coldly. Both parents paused. Because you can't, said John angrily. The idea's absurd. I don't see it, Rose persevered. Well, I do, John delivered himself, and let that suffice. Rose's face indicated the near approach of tears. It was at this juncture that Bessie opened the door and announced Mr. Tremlow. I just called to bring back that magnificent great court, he said. It's, it's hanging up on its proper hook in the hall. Then he turned specially to Leonora, who sat isolated near the fire. She was not surprised to see him, because she had felt sure that he would at once return the overcoat in person. She had counted on him doing so. As he came towards her, she languorously lifted her arm without rising. The two bangles which she wore slipped tinkling down the wide sleeve. They shook hands in silence, smiling. I hope you didn't cake cold last night, she said at length. Well, not I, he replied, sitting down by her side. He was quick to detect the disturbance in the social atmosphere, and though he tried to appear unconscious of it, he did not succeed in the impossible. Moreover, Rose had evidently decided that despite his presence, she would finish what she had begun. Very well, father, she said. If you'll let me go at once, I'll come down for two days at Christmas. Yes. John grumbled, that's all very well, but, but, but who's to take you? you? You can't go alone. You know perfectly well that I only came back yesterday. He recited this fact precisely as though it constituted a grievance against Rose. As if I couldn't go alone, Rose exclaimed. If it's Sarah London you're talking about, Tremley said, I'll be going up tomorrow by the midday flyer and could look after any lady that happened to be on that train and would accept my services. He glanced pleasantly at Rose. Oh, Mr. Twemlow, the girl murmured. It was a ludicrously inadequate expression of her profound, passionate gratitude to Miss Knight, but she could say no more. But can you be ready, my dear? Leonora inquired. I am ready, said Rose. Oh, it's understood, then, Twemlow said later. We shall meet at the depot. I, I can't stop another moment now. I've, I've got a cab waiting outside. Leonora wished to ask him whether notwithstanding his partial assurance of the previous evening, his journey would really end at Euston, or whether he was not taking London en route for New York. But she could not bring herself to put the question. She hoped that John might put it. John, however, was taciturn. We shall see Rose off tomorrow, of course, was her last utterance to Tremlow. Leonora and her three daughters stood in the crowd on the platform of Knipe Railway Station, waiting for Arthur Tremlow and for the London Express. John had brought them to the station in the wagonette, had kissed Rose and purchased her ticket, and had then driven off to a creditors' meeting at Hambridge. All the women felt rather mournful amid that bustle and confusion. Leonora had said to herself again and again that it was absurd to regard this absence of Rose for a few weeks as a break in the family existence. Yet the phrase, the first break, the first break, ran continually in her mind. The gentle sadness of her mood noticeably affected the girls. It was as though they had all suddenly discovered a mutual, unsuspected tenderness. Millie put her hand on Rose's shoulder, and Rose did not resent the artless gesture. I hope Mr. Tremlow isn't going to miss it, said Ethel, 
voicing the secret apprehension of all. I shan't miss it anyhow, Rose remarked defiantly. Scarcely a minute before the train was due, Millie described Tremlow coming out of the booking office. They pressed through the crowd towards him. Ah, he exclaimed genially, here you are. Baggage labelled? We thought you weren't coming, Mr. Tremlow, Millie said. You did? I was kept quite a few minutes at the hotel. You see, I only had to walk across the road. We didn't really think any such thing, said Leonora. The conversation fell to pieces. Then the express, with its two engines, its gilded luncheon cars, and its post office van, thundered in, shaking the platform, and seeming to occupy the entire station. It had the air of pausing nonchalantly, disdainfully, in its mighty rush, from one distant land of romance to another, in order to suffer for a brief moment the assault of a puny and needlessly excited multitude. First stop, Williston, yelled the porters. Say, conductor, said Tremlow sharply, catching the luncheon car attended by the sleeve. You've got two seats reserved for me, Tremlow? Uh, Tremlow, yes, sir. Come along, he said, come along. The girls kissed at the steps of the car. Goodbye. Well, goodbye all, said Tremlow. I hope to see you again sometime. Say, next fall? You surely aren't, Leonora began. Yes, he resumed quickly. I say on Saturday. Must go back. Oh, Mr. Twemlow, Ethel and Millie complained together. Rose was standing on the steps. Leonora leaned and kissed the pale girl, madly, pressing her lips into Rose's cheek. Then she shook hands with Arthur Twemlow. Goodbye, she murmured. I guess I shall write to you, he said jauntily, addressing all three of them. And Ethel and Millie enthusiastically replied, Oh, do! The travellers penetrated into the car and reappeared at a window, one on either side of a table covered with a white cloth and laid for two persons. Oh, don't I wish I was going? Millie exclaimed, perceiving him. Rose was now flushed with triumph. She looked at Twemlow, her lips moved, she smiled. She was a woman in the world. Then they nodded and waved hands. The guard unfurled his green flag, the engine gave a curt, scornful whistle, and lo, the luncheon car was gliding away from Leonora, Ethel and Millie. Lo, the station was empty. I wonder what he will talk to her about, thought Leonora. They had to cross the station by the underground passage and wait twenty minutes for a squalid, shambling local train which took them to Shawport at the foot of the rise to Hillport. End of chapter 7、Chapter、Eight of Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Eight, The Dance. About three months after its rendering of Patience, the Bursley Amateur Operatic Society arranged to give a commemorative dance in the very scene of that histrionic triumph. The fete was to surpass in splendour all previous entertainments of the kind recorded in the annals of the town. It was talked about for weeks in advance. Several dressmakers nearly died of it. And as the day approached, the difficulty of getting oneself invited became extreme. You know, Mrs. Stanway, said Harry Burgess when he met Leonora one afternoon in the street, we are relying on you to be the best dressed woman in the place. She smiled with a calmness which had in it a touch of gentle cynicism. You shouldn't, she answered. But you're coming, aren't you? he inquired with eager concern. Of late, owing to the capricious frigidity of Millicent's attitude towards him, he had been much less a frequenter of Leonora's house, and he was no longer privy to all its doings. Oh, yes, she said, I suppose I shall come. That's all right, he exclaimed. If you come, you conquer. They passed on their ways. Leonora's existence had slipped back into its old groove since the departure of Tremlow, and the groove had deepened. She lived by the force of habit, hoping nothing from the future, but fearing more than a little. She seemed to be encompassed by a vague and sinister portents. After another brief interview of apparent security, John's situation was again disquieting. 
trade was good in the five towns. At least the manufacturers had temporarily forgotten to complain that it was very bad, and the Monday afternoon football matches were magnificently attended. Moreover, John had attracted favourable attention to himself by his shrewd proposals to the Manufacturers Association for reform in the method of paying farmers and placers. His ability was everywhere recognised. At the same time, however, the five towns looked askance at him. Rumour revived and said that he could not keep up his juggling performance for ever. He was known to have speculated heavily for a rise in the shares of a great brewery which had falsified the prophecies of its founders when they benevolently sold it to the investing public. Some people wondered how long John could hold those shares in a falling market. Leonora had no definite knowledge of her husband's affairs, since neither John nor any other person breathed a word to her about them. And yet she knew, by certain vibrations in the social atmosphere, as mysterious and disconcerting as those discovered by Röntgen in the physical, that disaster, after having been repelled, was returning from afar. Money flowed through the house as usual. Nevertheless, often, as she drove about Bursley, consciously exciting the envy and admiration which a handsome woman behind a fast cob is bound to excite, her shamed fancy pictured the day when Prince should belong to another, and she should walk perforce on the pavement in a tired genteely preserved from past affluence. Only women know this keenest pang of these secret misgivings, at once desperate and helpless. Nor did she find solace in her girls. One Saturday afternoon, Ethel came back from the duty visit to Aunt Hannah, and said as it were confidentially to Leonora, Fred called him while he was there, Mother, and stayed for tea. What could Leonora answer? Who could deny Fred the right to visit his great-aunt and his great-uncle, both rapidly ageing? And of what use to tell John? She desired Ethel's happiness, but from that moment she felt like an accomplice in the furtive wooing, and it seemed to her that she had forfeited both the confidence of her husband and the respect of her daughter. Months ago she meant, by force of some initiative, to regularise this idyll which by its stealthiness wounded the self-respect of all concern. Vain aspiration. And now the fact that Fred Riley had begun to call at Church Street appeared to indicate between him and Uncle Meshach a closer understanding which could only be detrimental to the interests of John. As for Rose, that child of misfortune did well during the first four days of the examination, but on the fifth day one of her chronic sick headaches had in two hours nullified all the intense and ceaseless effort of two years. It was precisely in chemistry that she had failed. She arrived from London in tears, and the tears were renewed when the formal announcement of defeat came three weeks later by telegraph. John added gaiety to the occasion by remarking, What did I tell you? The girl's proud and tenacious spirit, weakened by the long strain, was daunted at last. She lounged in the house and garden, listless, supine, torpid, instinctively waiting for nature's recovery. Millicent, alone in the house, was unreservedly cheerful and light-hearted. She had the advantage of Mr. Corfe's instruction for two hours every Wednesday, and expressed herself as well satisfied with his methods. Her own intimate friends knew that she quite intended to go on the stage, but they were enjoined to say nothing. Consequently, John Stanway was one of the few people in Bursley unaware of the definiteness of Millie's private plans. Leonora was another. Leonora sometimes felt that Millie's assertive and indestructible vivacity must be due to some specific cause. But Mr Cecil Corfe's reputation for seriousness and discretion precluded the idea that he was encouraging the girl to dream dreams without the consent of her parents. Leonora might have questioned Millie, but she perceived the futility of doing so. It became more and more clear to her that she did not possess the confidence of her daughters. They loved her, and they admired her, and she, for her part, made a point of trusting them. But their confidence was withheld. Under the influence of Arthur Tremlow, she had tried to assuage the customary asperities of home life, so far as possible, by a demeanour of generous, quick acquiescence, and she had not entirely failed. Yet the girls, with all the obtuseness and insensibility of adolescence, 
never thought of giving her the one reward which she desired. She sought tremulously to win their intimacy, but she sought too late. Rosa merely simply ignored her diffident advances, and even Ethel was not responsive. Leonora had trained up her children as she herself had been trained. She saw her error only when it could not be retrieved. The dear but transient vision of four women who had no secrets from each other, who understood each other, was finally dissolved. Amid the secret desolation of a life which, however, was not without love, amid her vain regrets for an irrecoverable youth and her horror of the approach of age, amid the empty lassitudes which apparently were all that remained of the excitement caused by Arthur Twemlow's presence, Leonora found a mournful and sweet pleasure in imagining that she had a son. This son combined the best qualities of Harry Burgess and Fred Riley. She made him tall as herself, handsome as herself, and, like herself, elegant. Shrewd, clever, and possibly virtuous, he was nevertheless distinctly capable of follies. But he told her everything, even the worst, and though sometimes she frowned, he smiled away the frown. He adored her. He appreciated all the feminine in her. He yielded to her whims, he kissed her chin and her wrist, held her sunshade, opened doors for her, allowed her to beat him at tennis and deliciously frightened her by driving her very fast round corners in a very high dog cart. And if occasionally she said, I'm not as young as I was, Gerald, he always replied, Oh, rot, mater. When Ethel or Millie remarked at breakfast, as they did now and then, that Mr. Tremlow had not fulfilled his promise of writing, Leonora would answer evenly, No, I expect he's forgotten us. And she would go and live with her son for a little. She summoned this Gerald, and it was for the last time, and she stood irresolutely waiting for her husband at the door of the ladies' cloakroom in the town hall. She was dressed in black mousseline de soie. The corsage, which fitted loosely except at the waist and the shoulders, where it was closely confined, was not too low, but it disclosed the beautiful diminutive rondures about the armpits, and behind the fine hollow of her back. The sleeves were long and full with tight wrists, ending in black lace. A band of pale pink silk, covered with white lace, wandered up one sleeve, crossed her breast in strict conformity with the top of the corsage, and wandered down the other sleeve. At the armpits, below the rondures, this band was punctuated with a pink rose. An extremely narrow black velvet ribbon clasped her neck. From the belt, which was pink, Full skirt ran down in a thousand perpendicular pleats. The effect of the loose corsage and of the belt on Leonora's perfect figure was to make her look girlish, ingenuous, immaculate, and with a woman's instincts she heightened the effect by swinging her programme restlessly on its ivory-tinted cord. They had arrived somewhat late, owing partly to John's indecision and partly to an accident with Rose's costume. On reaching the town hall, not only Ethel and Millie, but Rose also, had deserted Leonora eagerly, impatiently, as ducklings scurry into a pond. They passed through the cloakroom in a moment, Rose first. Rose was human that evening. Leonora did not mind. She anticipated the dance with neither joy nor melancholy, hoping nothing from it in her mood of neutral calm. John was talking with David Dane at the entrance to the gentleman's cloakroom, further down the corridor. Presently, old Mr Hawley, the doctor at Hillport, joined the other two, and then Dane moved away, leaving John and the doctor in conversation. Dane approached and saluted his client's wife with characteristic sheepishness. A large company, I, I believe, he said awkwardly. In evening dress, he was always particularly awkward. She smiled kindly on him thinking the while what a clumsy and objectionable fat little man he was. She knew he admired her, and would have given much to dance with her. But she did not care for his heavy eyes, and she despised him because he could not screw himself up to demand a place on her programme. Yeah, very, very large company, I believe, he said again, moving about nervously on his toes. Do you know how many invitations? she asked. 
No, no, I don't. Dane, John called out, come and listen to this. And the lawyer escaped from her presence like a schoolboy running out of school. What men, she thought bitterly, standing neglected with all her charm and all her distinction. What chivalry, what courtliness, what tile. Her son belonged to a different race of beings. Down the corridor came Harry Burgess, deep in converse with a male friend. The two were walking quickly. She did not choose to greet them, waiting there alone, and so she deliberately turned and put her head within the curtains of the cloakroom, as if to speak to someone inside. Dremlow was saying... It seemed to her that Harry, in passing, had uttered that phrase to his companion. She flushed and shook from head to foot. Then she reflected that Twemlow was a name common to dozens of people in the five towns. She bit her lip, surprised and angered at her own agitation. At the same time she remembered, why should she remember? Some gossip of John's to the effect that Harry Burgess was under a cloud at the bank because he had gone to London by a day trip on the previous Thursday without leave. London, perhaps. Am I forty or fourteen? She contemptuously asked herself. She heard John and Dane laugh loudly, and the jolly voice of the old doctor. Come along into the refreshment room for a minute. Determined not to linger another moment with these bores, she moved into the corridor. At the end of the vista of red carpet and gas jets rose the grand staircase, and on the lowest stair stood Arthur Twemlow. She had begun to traverse the corridor, and she could not stop now, and fifty feet lay between them. Oh, her heart cried in the intolerable spasm of a swift and mysterious convulsion. Why do you thus torture me? Every step was an agony. He moved towards her, and she noticed that he was extremely pale. They met. His hand found hers. Then it was that she perceived with a passionate gratitude how heaven had been watching over her. If John had not hesitated about coming, if her daughters had not deserted her in the cloakroom, if the old doctor had not provided himself with a new supply of naughty stories, if indeed everything had not occurred exactly as it had occurred, she would have been forced to undergo in the presence of witnesses the shock that she had just experienced, and she would have died. She felt that in those seconds she had endured emotion to the last limit of her capacity. She traced her providence, even in Harry's chance phrase, which had warned her, so broken the force of the stroke. Why, cruel one, did you play this trick on me? Can you not see what I suffer? It's her sad, littering eyes that reproachfully appealed to him. Did I know what would have his answer? Am I not equally a victim? She smiled pensively, and her lips murmured, Well, wonders will never cease. Such were the first words. I found I had to come back to London, she was soon explaining. And I met young Burgess at the Empire on Thursday night, and he told me about this affair, and gave me a ticket, and so I thought as I had been at the opera I might as well... He hesitated. Have you seen the girls? she inquired. He had not. On the flower-bordered staircase her foot slipped. She felt like a convalescent trying to walk after a long illness. Arthur, with a silent questioning gesture, offered his arm. Yes, please, she said, blandly. She wished not to say it, but she said it, and the next instant he was supporting her up the steps. Anything might happen now, she thought. The most impossible things might come to pass. At the top of the staircase they paused. They could hear the music faintly through closed doors. They had the precious illusion of being aloof, apart, separated from the world, sufficient to themselves, gloriously sufficient. Then someone opened the doors from within. The sound of the music suddenly freed, rushed out and smote them, and they entered the ballroom. She was acutely conscious of her beauty and of the distinction of his blanched, stern face. The floor was thronged by entwined couples who, under the rhythmic domination of the music, glided and revolved in the elaborate pattern of a mazurka. With their rapt gaze and their rigid bodies floating smoothly 
over a hidden mechanism of flying feet. They seemed to be the victims of some enchantment, of which the music was only a mode, and which led them enthralled through endless curves of infallible beauty and grace. Form, colour, movement, melody, and the voluptuous galvanism of delicate contacts were all combined in this unique ritual of the dance, this strange convention whose significance emerged from one mystery deeper than the fundamental notes of the bass fiddle, and lost itself in another more light than the sudden flash of a shirt front or the tremor of a lock of hair. The goddess reigned, and right about the hall the guardians of decorum, the enemies of Aphrodite, enchanted too, watched with the simplicity of doves the great Aphrodisian festival, blind to the eternal verities of a satin slipper, a drooping eyelash, a parted lip. Music ceased. The spell was lifted for a time. And while old alliances were being dissolved and new ones formed in the eager promiscuity of this interval, all remarked proudly on the success of the evening. With the gleam of every eye, the sway of the goddess was acknowledged. Romance was justified. Life itself was justified. The shop girl who put ten thousand stitches into the ruching of her crimson skirt well symbolised the human attitude that night. As, leaning heavily on a man's arm, she crossed the floor under the blazing chandelier, she secretly exulted in each stitch of her incredible labour. Two hours and she would be back in the cold, celibate bedroom, littered with the shabby realities of existence, and the spotted glass would mirror her lugubrious yawn. Eight hours and she would be back in the dreadful shop, tying on the black apron. The crimson skirt would never look the same again, but rare blossoms fade too soon. And in exchange for the toil, the fatigue, and the distressing reaction, what had she won? She could not have said what she had won, but she knew that it was worth the ruinous cost, this bright fallacy, this fleeting chimera, this delusive ecstasy, this shadow and counterfeit of bliss which the goddess vouchsafed to her communicants. So thick and confused was the crowd that Leonora and Arthur, having inserted themselves into a corner near the west door, escaped the notice of any of their friends. They were as solitary there as on the landing outside. But Leonora saw quite near, in another corner, Ethel talking to Fred Riley. She noticed how awkward Fred looked in his new dress suit, and she liked him for his awkwardness. It seemed to her that Ethel was very beautiful. Arthur pointed out Rose, who was standing up with a lady member of the school board. Then Leonora caught sight of Millicent in the distance, handing her programme to the conductor of the opera. He recalled the notorious boast of the conductor that he had never known to dance with a bad dancer, whatever her fascination. Always when they met at a ball, the conductor would ask Leonora for a couple of waltzes and would lead her out with an air of saying to the company, Now see what fine dancing is. Like herself, he danced with the frigidity of a professor. She wondered whether Arthur could dance really well. The placard by the orchestra said, Extra. Shall we? Arthur whispered. He made a way for her through the outer fringe of people to the middle space where the couples were forming. Her last thoughts, as she gave him her hand, the thoughts half pitiful and half scornful of John, David Dane, and the doctor, brutishly content in the refreshment room. There stole out, troubling the expectant air, softly, alluringly, evocatively, the first warning notes of their unique classic of the ballroom, that extraordinary composition which more than any other work of art unites all Western nations in a common delight, which is adored equally by profound musicians and by the lightest cocottes, and which, unscathed and splendid, still miraculously survives the deadly ordeal of eternal perfunctory reiterance. The masterpiece of Johann Strauss. Why? Leonora exclaimed, her excitement straining impatiently in the leash. The Blue Danube! He laughed, quietly gay. While the chords, with tantalising pauses and deliberation, approached the magic moment of the waltz itself, he was conscious that his hold of her became firmer and more assertive. 
and she surrendered to an overmastering influence, as one surrenders to chloroform, desperately but luxuriously. And when at the invitation of the melody the whole company in the centre of the floor broke into movement and the spell was resumed, she lost all remembrance of that which had passed and all apprehension of that which was to come. She lived passionately and yet languorously in the vivid present. Her eyes were level with his shoulder, and they looked with an entranced gaze along his arm, seeing automatically the faces, the lights, and the colours which swam in a rapid, confused procession across their field of vision. She did not reason nor recognise. These fleeting images appearing and disappearing on the horizon of Arthur's elbow produced no effect on her. She had no thoughts. Her entire being was absorbed in a transport of obedience to the beat of the music and to Arthur's directing pressures. She was happy, but her bliss had in it that element of stinging pain of intolerable anticipation which is seldom absent from a felicity too intense. Surely I shall sink down and die, said her heart, seeming to faint at the joyous crises of the music rose and fell in tides of varying rapture. Nevertheless, she was determined to drink the cup slowly, to taste every drop of that sweet and excruciating happiness. She would not utterly abandon herself. The fear of inanition was only a wayward presence, after all, and her strong nature cried out for further tests to prove its fortitude and its power of dissimulation. As the band slipped into the final section of the waltz, she wilfully dragged the time, deepening a little the curious, superficial languor which concealed her secrets, and at the same time increasing her consciousness of Arthur's control. She dreaded now that which had been intolerable should cease. She wished ardently to avert the end. The glare of lights, the separate sounds of the instruments, the slurring of feet on the smooth floor, the lineaments of familiar faces, all the multitudinous and picturesque detail of gyrating humanity around her, these phenomena forced themselves on her unwitting perception. And she tried to push them back and to spend every faculty in savouring the ecstasy of that one physical presence which was so close, so enveloping and so inexplicably dear. But in vain, in vain, the band rioted through the last balls of the waltz. Strange, disconcerting silence and inertia supervened, and Arthur loosed her. As she sat down on the cane chair which Arthur had found, Leonora's characteristic ease of manner deserted her. She felt conspicuous and embarrassed, and she could neither maintain her usual cold, nonchalant glance in examining the room, nor look at Arthur in a natural way. She had the illusion that everyone must be staring at her with amazed curiosity. Yet her furtive searching eye could not discover a single person except Arthur who seemed to notice her existence. All were preoccupied that night with immediate neighbours. Will you come down into the refreshment room? Arthur asked. She observed with annoyance that he too was confused, nervous, but still very pale. She shook her head without meeting his gaze. She wished above all things to behave simply and sincerely, to speak in her ordinary voice and to use familiar phrases. But she could not. On the contrary, she was seized with a strong impulse to say to him entreatingly, Leave me, as though she were a person on the stage. She thought of other phrases such as, Please go away, and Do you mind leaving me for a while? but her tongue, somehow insisting on the melodramatic, would not utter these. Leave me, she was frightened by her own words, and added hastily with the most seductive smile that her lips had ever framed. Do you mind? I shall call tomorrow, he said anxiously, almost gruffly. Shall you be in? She nodded, and he left her. She did not watch him depart. May I have the honour, gracious lady? It was the conductor of the opera who addressed her in his even, apparently sarcastic tones. I'm afraid I must rest a bit, she said, smiling quite naturally. I've hurt my foot a little. Oh, it's nothing, it's nothing, but I, I must sit still for a bit. 
She could not comprehend why, unintentionally and without design, she should have told this stupid lie and told it so persuasively. She foresaw how the tedious consequences of the fiction might continue throughout the evening. For a moment she had the idea of announcing a sprained ankle and returning home at once. But the thought of old Dr Hawley's presence in the building deterred her. She perceived that her foot must get gradually better, and that she must be resigned. Oh, Mama! cried Rose, coming over to her. Just fancy Mr Twemlow being back again. Why did you let him leave? Has he gone? Yes, he just saw me on the stairs and told me he might catch the last car to night. Our dance, I think, Miss Rose, said a young man with a gardenia. Rose, flushed and sparkling, was carried off. The ball proceeded. John Stanway had a singular capacity for not enjoying himself on those social occasions when to enjoy oneself is a duty to the company. But this evening, as the hour advanced, he showed the symptoms of a sharp attack of gaiety such as visited him from time to time. He and Dr Hawley and Dane formed an ebullient centre of high spirits, and they upheld the ancient traditions. They professed a liking for old-fashioned dances and for old-fashioned ways of dancing the steps, which modern enthusiasm for the waltz had not extinguished. And they found an appreciable number of followers. The organisers of the ball, the upholders of correctness, punctilio and the mode, fretted and fought against the antagonistic influence. Ass, said the conductor of the opera bitterly, when Harry Burgess told him that Stanway suggested Sir Roger to Coverley for an extra. I wonder what his wife thinks of him. Sir Roger de Coverley was not danced, but twenty or thirty late stairs, with Stanway and Dane in charge, crossed hands in a circle and sang Old Lang Syne at the close. It was one of those incredible things that can only occur between midnight and cockcrow. During this revolting rite, the conductor and his friends sought sanctuary in the refreshment room. Leonora, Ethel and Minnie were also there, but Rose and the lady member of the school board had remained upstairs to sing Old Lang Syne. Now, girls, said Stanway with loud good humour, invading the select apartment with his followers. Time to go. Carpenter's been waiting half an hour. Your foot all right again, Nora? Quite, she replied. Are you really ready? She had so interminably waited that she could not believe the evening to be at length actually finished. They all exchanged adieu, Stanway and his cronies effusively, the opposing and outraged faction with a certain fine acrimony. Good night, Fred, said John, throwing a backward patronising glance at Riley, who had strolled uneasily into the room. The young man paused before replying. Good night, he said simply. His demeanour indicated, do not patronise me too much. Fred could not dance, but he had audaciously sat out four dances with Ethel, and this his first ball, and the serious young man had the strange, agreeable sensation of feeling a dog. He dared not, however, accompany Ethel to the carriage, as Harry Burgess accompanied Millicent. Harry had been partially restored to favour again during the latter half of the entertainment, just in time to prevent him from getting tipsy. The fact was that Millicent had vaguely expected in view of her position as prima donna, to be the bell of the ball. But there had been no bell, and Millicent was put to the inconvenience of discovering that she could do nothing without footlights. Ask Tremlow to come up tomorrow night, Nora, said John, still elated, turning on the box seat as the wagonette rattled briskly over the paved crossing at the top of Old Castle Street. She mumbled something through her furs. And is he coming? asked Rose. He said he'd try to. John lighted a cigar. He's very queer, said Millicent. How? Rose aggressively demanded. Well, imagine him going off like that. He's always going off suddenly. Millicent stopped and then added, He only danced with Mother, but he's a good dancer. I should think he was, Ethel murmured, roused from lethargy. Isn't he just Mother? Leonora mumbled again. Your mother's knocked up, said John dryly. These late nights don't suit her. So you reckon Mr Tremlow's a good dancer, eh? No one spoke further. John threw his cigar into the road. The rug, 
Leonora could feel the knees of all her daughters as they sat huddled and limp with fatigue in the small body of the wagonette. Her shoulders touched Ethel's, and every one of Minnie's fidgety movements communicated itself to her. Mother and children were so close that they could not have been closer had they lain in the same grave. And yet the girls, and John too, had no slightest suspicion how far away the mother was from them, how blind they were, how amazingly they had been deceived. They deemed Leonora to be like themselves, the victim of reaction and weariness, so drowsy that even the joltings of the carriage could not prevent a doze. She marvelled, she could not help marvelling, that her spiritual detachment should remain unnoticed. The phenomenon frightened her as something full of strange risks. Was it possible that none had caught a glimpse of the intense illumination and activity of her brain, burning and labouring there so conspicuously amid the other brains sombre and dormant? And was it possible that the girls had observed the quality of Arthur's dancing and had observed nothing else? Common sense tried to reassure her. It did not quite succeed. Her attitude resembled that of a person who leans against a firm rail over the edge of a precipice. There is no danger, but the precipice is so deep that he fears. And though the fear is a torture, the sinister magnetism of the abyss forbids him to withdraw. She lived again in the waltz, in the gliding motions of it, the delicious fluctuations of the reverse, the long, trance-like union, the instinctive avoidances of other contacts. He whispered the music, endlessly repeating those poignant and voluptuous phrases which linger in the memory of all the world. And she recalled and reconstituted Arthur's physical presence and the emanating charm of his disposition and dwelt on them long and long. Instead of lessening, the secret commotion within her increased and continued to increase. While brooding with feverish joy over the immediate past, her mind reached forward and existed in the appalling and fatal moment, for whose reality, however, her eagerness could scarcely wait when she could see him once more. And it asked unanswerable questions about his surprising return from New York, and his pallor, and the tremor in his voice, and his swift departure. Suddenly, she knew that she was planning to have the girls out of the house tomorrow afternoon between four and five o'clock. Her spine shivered. She grew painfully hot. Tears rushed to her eyes. She pitied herself profoundly. She said that she did not know what was the matter with her or what was going to happen. She could not give names to things. She only felt that she was too violently alive. Now, Mrs. John roused her. The carriage had stopped and he had already descended. She got out last, and Carpenter drove away while John was still fumbling in his hip pocket for the latch key. The night was humid and very dark. Leonora and the girls stood waiting on the gravel. John groped his way into the blackness of the portico to unfasten the door. A faint gleam from the hall gas came through the leaded fanlight. This scarcely perceptible glow and the murmur of John's expletives were all that came to the women from the mystery of the house. The key grated in the lock and the door opened. God damn! Damway exclaimed distinctly with fierce annoyance. He had fallen headlong into the hall, and his silk hat could be heard hopping towards the staircase. Pa! Billy protested, shocked. John sprang up, fuming, turned the gas on to the fool and rushed back to the doorway. Ah! he shouted. I knew it was a tramp lying there. Get up! Is the beggar asleep? They all bent down, startled into gravity, to examine a form which lay in the portico nearly parallel with the step and below it. It's Uncle Meshach, said Ethel. Oh, Mother! Then my aunt's had another attack, cried John, and he's come up to tell us. Oh, Millie, Millie, run for Carpenter! It seemed to Leonora, as with sudden awe she vaguely figured an august and capricious power which conferred experience on mortals like a wonderful gift, that that bestowing hand was never more full than when it had given most. End of chapter 8